In this video, I'll be introducing rings. Now, rings have a really simple definition. The, the definition is not hard to learn at all. And so what I'll do is I'll first give you the intuition and then give you the definition afterward. So the most basic example of a ring is the integers. And the integers is what inspires most of the definitions for rings. Rings are mostly based around the integers. Now, why are they based around the integers? Well, the integers have two operations, plus and multiply. And now these two operations have special properties that you should probably keep an eye on. And it's that z under addition is an abelian group. And uh, by abelian, I mean a plus b equals b plus a for all a and b. All right? Another thing you should notice is that z under multiplication is not a group. It's not a group at all. It's not abelian, nor is it a group. That is because for instance, 2. What is the inverse of 2? For it to be a group, every single element has to have an inverse. Well, the inverse of 2 is 1 half, because 2 times a half is 1. However, a uh, crazy revolution, I, know, uh, I don't know if you know this, 1 half is not an integer. And so this is an example of a value that has no inverse. And there's many, many examples in the integers. There's actually only two values that have inverses. It's 1 and negative 1. Now, this concept of having inverses within the integers will actually be important later. And so I'll discuss that later. But now, uh, uh, a property that you've probably already thought of that I haven't mentioned yet is that a times b plus c equals a times b plus a times c. It's just the distributive property. And draw the little arrows if you want. And now another property, which you might have noticed, is that a times 0 is equal to 0. That's like for every single a, that's true. And then another multiplication property is that a times 1 equals a for all a. Now that might seem like a stupid thing to point out, but because z under multiplication is not a group, we do not automatically have that it has an identity. And so I think it's useful to point that out. Now I'm just going to list out another property of the integers, although this is not necessarily related to rings, although you'll see in the future that it kind of is, is that they have unique factorization. Every single number can be written as a, a product of primes. And they can be written as a unique product of primes. And that's unique factorization. And that's a property of the integers. OK, that's pretty cool. But what about some other uh, sets that have two operations, like the real numbers? Let's go through everything that it has. Okay, well, it has plus and multiply, obviously. Okay, well, r under addition is also an abelian group. Okay, what about r under multiplication? Well, actually, r under multiplication is also not a group, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove 0. I'm going to remove 0 from r and do it under multiplication. So this is a group, and it's actually an abelian group, but I'm not going to write that. So we have this property, which z does not. And r minus 0, so everything except for 0, has an inverse. So it's very different from the integers, actually, if you look at multiplication. And now the reason why 0 doesn't have an inverse is because 1 over 0 doesn't exist. That's the thing you should know by now. <laughs> All right, the next thing is the distributive property, which it does have. So let me just copy that down. 
And the next property, which is a times 0, is going to be 0. And a times 1 is going to be equal to a. That is also true in here. Now, what about unique factorization? Well, in the real numbers, do we, do we really have a concept of unique factorization? Not, not really, because there's no primes. Because imagine what primes are. Their primes are s things that are not divisible by anything besides itself and 1. But r, that is never true, because 2 is divisible by 2. It's also divisible by 2.5. It's divisible by pi. Because every single one would get you a real number again. And so unique factorization doesn't really have a concept. So this really has like no. I'm going to put question marks because maybe there is a thing and we're just not thinking hard enough. But for now, no unique factorization. All right. Well, another thing we can do is z mod n z. This is another example of something with two operations. Let's just go through it again. It has plus and multiply. All right. What about is is it a and then z mod n z under addition is in fact an abelian group. Is a cyclic group actually? Is a cyclic group. That's the most important. And then the next thing, which is under multiplication. Now, uh, under multiplication is actually sort of a weird thing for z mod n z because, well, what if I have a prime z mod p z under multiplication? Well, there's this fact about primes, which is that every single element of z mod p z has an inverse. I'm pretty sure I have a video on this. If I do, it'll be up in the i card up there. Like there, maybe. I don't know where it's going to be. <laughs> so z mod pz, every single element has an inverse, except for 0, obviously. So z mod pz, removing 0, under multiplication, is a group, right? Because every single one has an inverse, but if I have z mod, say, p, q, z, where p and q are both primes, then actually two of them don't have inverses. It's actually p and q have no inverses, which is everything else does. It's just p and q don't. If we're doing uh, z mod n z, we're moving zero. So this is just for any amount. The actual rule behind it is the set of divisors. So m divides n. So for every value which divides n, it has no inverse. That's a fact that I think I proved before, although. And the reason why it didn't work here is because the only two divisors of p were 1, which is the identity, and p itself, which is 0, which we excluded. And so z mod n z has multiple cases for that one. It has distributive, it has this property, you can prove that. But then the next property, which is unique factorization. Again, I don't know exactly how, uh, or we don't know exactly how to continue this. Like, at least not at the moment, so I'm just going to put no, question mark, question mark, question mark, uh, no unique factorization. Our perception may change as the series goes along, but for now, like there's no extension of unique factorization. But this is the idea of rings. It's this plus and multiply. Plus and multiply. This z under addition is an abelian group, is preserved throughout all of them. The property of distributive law, this law, so di the distributive law is one that's shared between all of them. The law that a times 1 equals a is shared between all of them. And that's really, that's really it. So this is our idea for rings, is to base it off of the properties that were preserved here. 
And again, unique factorization is a weird one because it may or may not be preserved. We don't really know yet because we don't have an extension. We don't have enough uh, of a framework to be able to determine what unique factorization means in these other contexts. So now that you have an idea of what a ring can be, let's do definition one of a ring. So it's sort of following the shared patterns between all of those, which was that we had two operations. So we had r, plus, and multiplies. r is the set, plus is plus, multiplies is multiply. Uh, it has the following properties. One, that r under addition is an abelian group. Second property, that uh, multiplication is not going to have to be a group, it's just going to have the pro uh, following properties. That it has the associative property, this is just one that you want to have for any operation, and that it also has uh, number three, that a times one is equal to one times a is equal to a for all a. That's the other property, and then number four is that we have a times b plus c is equal to a times b plus a times c. And uh, notice how I never said that multiplication has to be uh, commutative or abelian, and so we actually have to add in another term for the right-hand distributive law. That's it. That's the definition of a ring. This is just following the properties that we sh saw were shared throughout all of the previous sets. Now, there's a couple of properties which I brought up that might not necessarily be true, which is unique factorization. And now there's a special type of ring, which is called a unique factorization domain, or a UFD. That's a special type of ring. I'll discuss what that exactly means in a later episode. But there's another type of ring, which is uh, one that we deal with often, and it's where multiplication is commutative. It's where A times B equals B times A, and this is called a commutative ring. I don't know why it's not called like an abelian ring, but it's called a commutative ring where multiplication is commutative. Uh, there's another type, which is called an integral domain, which deals with when you multiply two values and you set it equal to zero. Well, well that means that either a is zero or b is zero, right? That's sort of the idea behind factoring. If I'm trying to solve x minus 1 times x minus 2 equals 0, I use the fact that either this is going to be 0 or that's going to be 0. Right? But this property where you can factor and then solve polynomials is not always true. And it's only true for what's called an integral domain. And so these are just the different types of rings that we'll come across. An integral domain, a commutative ring, a unique factorization domain. There's many different types of rings. And so when we study rings, the major thing we're going to be studying are all of the different types of rings instead of just rings in general. We rarely just deal with normal rings. We always want to add more structure onto it so that we're able to study it with more nuance. And these rings usually have much more um, accessibility than the, just the normal rings. And so hopefully this introduction was useful, but if not, eh, maybe I'll redo it. Who knows? All right, that's it.